Amen. Resurrection power. As I watched that video, I just kind of stumbled across it, and, and I thought, man, that's just so cool. And the, and the part that just really began to get, get me is when he stepped into that water. Of course, you know, that's not the way we baptize. You just walk out and, and dunk yourself in water, but it's not about that. He followed the video, and when he just looks up, and then as he fell back, it was as though he had died. And that's really very scriptural because we are to die to our old selves. And, bear, and baptism is a symbol, a sign of a burial that our old life has been buried. We've been resurrected with Christ to, to walk a new life. And then where I got the goosebumps is as he started walking back like, to his car and all these people started coming out of the, out of the field and just the, the, that right there. And so I just loved that video and that kind of that the title of that song the thought of that song about the power that we have the freedom that we get to uh, enjoy as believers in Christ that the world so desperately needs we can find that in our main passage today uh, the, the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 you ought to be familiar with this and I'm sure you are we've been studying Acts in Sunday school but it didn't take Sunday school lessons to, to know about Acts chapter 1 verse 8 as you're turning there just to, just to have that mark in your Bible uh, we, we read there that Jesus says that you will receive power. So that's that resurrection power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. And then he lays it out here and to the other uh, parts of the world. So we're to be his witnesses. And that's, uh, that's what we want to talk about today. It's just being his witnesses. I, uh, I, I can... Uh, probably almost guaranteed that I'm not going to tell you anything brand new today. I'm going to remind you just as I need to be reminded that we need to be about the business of being His witnesses. Right? We need to be His witnesses. Do not skip the first part of that, uh, the, the main part of that verse before He says you'll be my witnesses. First He says you'll receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come to you. And when we say yes to Christ and we ask Him to come and to live in our life and to be our, our Lord and Savior, we're asking His Holy Spirit to come and live within us. We become the temple of God and that's what happens. That's the spiritual uh, reality of what happens when we believe in Jesus Christ. And so we want that power. We need to pray for that power. We need to think as we're being witnesses, we don't go out in our own authority. Just before that, Jesus says, all authority is given to me and so I send you out. So we don't go in our own authority, nor do we go in our own power. If so, we notice it real quick that there is no power. <laughs> we have no authority to go out there and to, to tell people about Christ. But He sends us and we go in His authority. Alright, so what I've done is I want to make this simple. All right, uh, as much for me as it is for you. All right, let's make this simple. I used the title today of the sermon. I was trying to make sure I worded it right, but just I've got to hand it to you. All right, which is a phrase we use sometimes when we're in a situation or someone's telling us something, and maybe we're listening to their story and we kind of think, yeah, but you know, and so finally we might just kind of make a little disclaimer. Well, yeah, but at least I got to hand it to you. You're at least trying or something. And so we kind of praise that. I got to just hand it to you. You got to give me something. Well, this is a little bit different application of that phrase. I just want to hand it to you. All right, so we're going to we're going to use a very easy witnessing tool today. There's all kinds of witnessing tools. The the first and foremost witnessing tool you have is just the fact that you're a witness, a witness to Christ, a witness of your life. What has Jesus done for you? Has He saved you? If you can say yes, He saved you. How do He do that? Well, you tell the story. You're just a witness to what He's done in your life. And there's your witnessing tool. That's the only tool you really need. But there's a lot of neat tools, methods. Uh, there's this one I picked this up uh, the other day. And, and I'm not going to take it out because I may not be able to pull, put that back in. I think I could. But anyways, it is the Evangel Cube. It's a little uh, thing. You say it's a little bit bigger, but this is a smaller one. And it's just a little cube that you can go through and you can tell them the story of Christ. How Christ came, died on the cross, and all that kind of stuff. And that's a neat little tool. We also do uh, witnessing bracelets. How many of y'all have ever seen a witnessing bracelet? Uh, it has the colors, not as many as you have thought, all right? I thought I had one. I looked all through my desk and I said, I know I've made those. It's got the little colors, you know, uh, red for the, the for sin and, and, and or black for sin and, and white and Jesus covers our sin and all that kind of stuff. And it tells the, the gospel story with the bracelet. I couldn't find that, so I threw one on real quick and mine's black and white. So I'll, I'll use this to say... The gospel is black and white. You're either saved or you're not, all right? You're, you're either heaven bound or you're hell bound, right? So uh, that, that's not what this is. But anyways, uh, we can use all kinds of tools like that. But I know a lot of times we're out and about, we're going, and the Bible I, 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 
says, as you go, make disciples. And so as you're going, uh, even today, tomorrow, throughout this next week, we begin to do what Jesus told the disciples. Look at the harvest. Just look at the people and realize they're those souls that are in that field that just need to come out and receive the gospel. So as we go, we want to look for opportunities to be His witness. And sometimes we make it way too complicated. If you do carry your Bible, you're probably going to scare a non-believer to death and they, they may, you know, oh no, or you'll just turn them off because you're just going to preach at them or something like that. Use your Bible that you got. They need to know the Word of God. But a lot of times you don't have your Bible handy. But you got your witness. And I think as you go about day to day, you have your hands with you, all right? Usually you take your hands with you. If you don't, if not real forgetful, you have your hands. So uh, let me do a little test real quick to see. I want to make sure that I'm not asking something of you that is, is unfair. Uh, if you have a left hand, would you raise it? We're not going not to swear to anything or vote on anything, all right? But keep, keep it up, man. Sure. Okay, a lot of, okay, I think we've got potential. Everybody can do this, all right? Now, let's, let's try this right here, okay? Uh, put your thumb up. Okay, you all doing great so far. Most of most. Okay. Uh, one. Try that. Two. Where I'm going with this. Three. Four. Five. You all ready to do that? Oh, all right. Got it. All right. So, it's just a simple way to share the gospel, but I want us to think through it. By the way, I've been through a lot of uh, uh, witnessing training programs and all that kind of stuff that we spent like weeks, if not months, being trained with a million scriptures and all. And I'm so glad that that's a, a good foundation. I have used it. I've used parts of that. And, and But there's no magical way to do it. And, and, and to, to learn and memorize all these charts and graphs and scriptures and what to say next and how to transition from one uh, page to the next and all that kind of stuff is, is just a lot. And, and you're not going to have that with you probably as you go out with it. So as I think about this in a handy way to share the gospel, then uh, then I hope this will be something that can benefit you. Then maybe God will just bring this back to you to your memory. I'm going to ask you to memorize this today, and I believe you can do it. You already got the motions down or the, the use of your of your hand. First thing is thumbs up. One more time, let me see your thumbs up. All right, thumbs up. Now thumbs up, and if you want to just if you're taking the notes, just fill in that blank right there, is that God wants you to go to heaven. Alright? God wants you to go to heaven, and so do you. Uh, so thumbs up on that, alright? God wants you to go to heaven. That's a thumbs up kind of uh, phrase right there. Now, now, the fact that God loves you and He wants you to go to heaven is not where it ends. That's just where it starts. Alright? Uh, back in the... I won't say good old days, but back in the day... Uh, if you were standing on the side of the road and you were doing this right here, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> You're hitching a ride. All right, don't do it. All right, don't don't. It's just not safe to do anyways. All right. But anyways, back in the day, I mean, it was pretty common. People still do it today or something like that. But now, if you're out there and you're hitching the ride, all right, and, and someone's crazy enough to pull over and let you get in their car and they don't know you, and then that's all them, I think. But anyways, uh, if they're going to let you in the car and you get in the car and they're saying, man, I just need to get into Oklahoma City or I need to get into Tulsa and I, my car's broke down or something like that, uh, just give me a ride. You don't anticipate having to pay for that ride. It's not Uber. You call Uber or you call a taxi, right? Uh, but this is, I'm hitching the ride, which means I'm looking for a free ride. Guess what? Getting to heaven is a free ride for us, but not for God. <laughs> All right? It cost Him His Son. It cost Him everything to be able to give us this way to get to heaven. But we need to start by first knowing that God is a loving God. God loves you and God wants you to go to heaven. And, and there's something basic. Uh, I know not everybody believes in heaven, so I can't say everybody wants to go to heaven because some don't believe in heaven. Guess what? I believe with all my heart. Just as I believe God is real, I believe heaven is real as well. And it's a place that we go to. And it's a wonderful place. And, and salvation is the way we get there. Alright? And so, uh, I'm all about hearing what God has to say so that we can know and we can tell others uh, that we want to get to, that you can go to heaven. Now, it's hard to convince some people. It really is hard to convince some people when something is just too good to pass up. I mean, you've got, you've got knowledge of something and you just, this, this is so good. This is the good news. That's what the gospel is. 
and yet some people are so hard to convince, and that's that's really sad. Uh, how many of y'all would think it'd be kind of cool if you had uh, just on the spot five million dollars? Would that kind of you be a thumbs up for that? All right, then you got five. I could have it. I could be passing out first uh, 100 people to say yes or something. I don't know. All right, I don't. But would, I mean, a, a gift of five million dollars would be. I don't know what I'd do with it. I'd panic, and then I'd find all these relatives that I never knew I had, and then some of y'all would be my friends after all, and that kind of stuff. Uh, same would be work same way with you. I'm your friend. If you get if someone gives you five million dollars, remember me, and all that kind of stuff. All right. Well, let me think. Okay, let me take another step. So we're a little greedy. Some of y'all go, no, I don't know, no, pass up that kind of stuff. It's too good to be true. No, it's not. How many of y'all would spend, if you had it, five million dollars to tell someone else about Christ? Would you be willing to, if it cost five million dollars? To be able to tell this good news that's just too too good to pass up, but it's going to cost you five million dollars to tell that. I'm not going to ask you to give thumbs up on that. You just got to think about that. Spend five million dollars. I don't know. Uh, by the way, how much uh, how much is a trip to, to Zambia? It's three thousand four to thirty thirty four hundred something like that. About less than five million, uh, but it still costs something, but nothing like that. But would you spend five million dollars to tell someone the best news of their life? Well, guess what? Today, I already mentioned it, you know I'm all about this, but today is Super Bowl Sunday. And did you know in every Super, every Super Bowl Sunday that comes around, all right, that I really could care less who's playing or who wins or anything like that, but every year they start saying this, and I've heard this before, and every time I just can't believe what I'm hearing. It costs $5 million for a 30-second commercial. Some of y'all have heard that on the news. Five million dollars to spend 30 seconds telling us what is too good to pass up. That we just got to know that you have to buy this or have this or sign up here and, and get this or be a part of something. And they're willing to pay it over and over and over. Five million dollars for 30 seconds of something that is here today and gone on. I've never seen a, uh, a, a 30 second gospel presentation at the Super Bowl. Uh, one of those uh, commercial slots. Um, but all kinds of organizations and some are just about a message about help a pet or, or save a life or something like that. So there's some good things other than just materialistic to come out of that. But $5 million. Well, it is the good news that heaven is real. And heaven is a free gift. We know that it's the free gift of God. So it's not going to cost someone $5 million. They don't have to give a deposit or sign up or pay anything they just need to receive this one thing all right we're almost we're, we're on our way now so we got the thumbs up can you do thumbs up okay so you you're, you're see an opportunity to go by the way you want to go to heaven i do too <laughs> guess what god wants you to go to heaven that's kind of a funny thing just kind of thumbs up but anyway you can do that all right so thumbs up good news is uh that if, if, that heaven is a free gift but there's one problem <laughs> Okay, so there's our second one. Thumbs up. God wants you to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. All right. But what? Can I see the one? Uh, keep us awake. That way anyway. But keep our arms awake. You can close your eyes. Do this, probably. All right. What do you say? What do you say? Here we go. The sword in the church. All right. So, one. There's one problem with this whole scenario. And that problem is sin. So, in your slot, just put the one problem is sin. That is the one problem. Oh, we got a lot of problems, but that's the one that keeps us from receiving that free gift, or at least that's the one that the reason we don't have that gift of, of heaven and know that. We know this from some very, very, very familiar scriptures. I hope you know these scriptures. I don't have a scripture with each one of these, so you don't even have to memorize the scripture, but let me tell you, these are scriptural type uh, concepts that are coming out in this simple presentation. But Romans 3.23 says, For all have what? Sinned. All have sinned, alright? So there it is. The one problem, we all have the one problem, and that is sin. It's a problem of not having heaven. So one, one problem is that we have sinned. But for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Uh, God is a holy God. God is a loving God. There's all kinds of things we can think about that and why that sin separates us from God. And there's all kinds of things you can say in your own testimony, in your own thinking about how that one problem in your life at one time was so overwhelming you didn't even know if there was hope. You didn't know that there was a God that loved you. 
And then someone came up and told you, or you went to church, or someone somehow you heard the gospel, and you heard that God loves you, you heard John 3.16 or something like that, and you thought, is that really true? That is too good to pass up. And if you've been saved, and at some point you understood that you had a problem, and it was keeping you from that first thing, and that was heaven, but it is too good. You don't want to pass that up. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You jump right over to chapter six of uh, uh, Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 23, and it says that the wages of that sin, the reason that's a problem, the, what we deserve, what we earn, the wages of that sin is death. I don't even have to look it up. We know that. When we sin, when we get wet, whatever age, when we understand there's a right and wrong and we choose wrong, that's called sin. And when we sin, it separates us from God. We become spiritually dead. And to be spiritually dead, you cannot enter into heaven. And we exist that way from the moment we first understand what sin is. And we don't have to understand the Bible. We don't have to have everything in church. We just need to know this is right and this is wrong and boy, I just I choose this <laughs> in that moment for that one thing. And, and none of us just have one example of that. We have one after the other, after the other, after the other. We die and our flesh leads us to more sin and sin entangles us and ensnares us and we become wrapped up into sin that we can't see our way out. And it is hopeless. And there is nothing that we can do to out to outdo sin. Sin takes over in our life. And so it, it, may, it renders us dead. And, and that's, again, the problem with sin. Um, have you ever had a problem that, um, that you, you're dealing with, you know, problems every, every day, every week, whether it's a health problem, a financial problem, a relationship problem, or, or, or a situation or something like that, and you think, man, i got a problem, and I just soon it gets solved like yesterday. All right. uh, I'm tired of dealing with this. I don't know what's going to happen, but I wish there was a solution to my problem, and I wish it was here uh, already. Well, number two. All right. Two thousand years ago. Two thousand years ago is our next one. Two thousand years ago, Jesus came to solve our sin problem. So write that on the line if you fit all that. Two thousand years ago, Jesus came to solve our sin problem. 2,000 years ago. This is a problem that has already been solved. Now, it hadn't been fixed and hadn't been applied, but it has been solved. The solution is right there. So God wants you to go to heaven. One problem is sin, but 2,000 years ago. How easy it is, all right? 2,000 years ago, Christ came to deal with that problem. Now, the problem is we can't get rid of guilt. We, we can't just know that there's a solution out there and all of a sudden just knowing that, all of a sudden now I can, I can fix that one problem. We still can't. We are guilty. Sin makes us guilty. And even though a solution has been pro provided 2,000 years ago, it, until it is our solution, until it becomes a part of our experience, it doesn't do us any good. Uh, I'm going to tattle on someone now. Yesterday at men's breakfast, all right, man, we had a great turnout. Uh, Rick Trow did a great job on the devotion, but he tricked your pastor. He didn't mean to. He really didn't. He used a good example. He was talking about some of these same things and everything. And there's all you know. There's the church members and all the men uh, from LifeGate was here and everything. And it was just rolling right on. Man, I was I was amen in him and everything was good. And I was sitting kind of up front and all these people all to my back. And he used an illustration. He said, and it's a great illustration. He said, how many of y'all have been in track? traffic uh, port. So your pastor, I just raised my hand. Yeah, I raised my hand and I kind of looked. I didn't see everybody. I didn't turn around. It was like, and so I put my hand down. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, he called me out. He said, well, I'm the pastor, you know. I was like, okay. So then he went on. I was kind of embarrassed, you know. I was like, yeah, I raised my hand. I thought everybody, everyone's been the traffic port, right, you know. And so I just sat there the rest of the time. But it was still good. And I, was, I, I stayed with you and I thought, well, I'm going to get him afterwards. So after I got up afterwards, I thanked him for his great uh, stomping that he gave me. All that. But, but then I had to tell the story, and I won't retell it now, but I, I, had, I had an explanation to give. And so I tried to explain why I was in traffic court. Y'all know enough about me, you know probably why I was in traffic court, all right? <laughs> anyway, it was not fun, all right? And guess what? I was guilty. And I knew going into it, was, I was guilty. But I did think I could explain and maybe get out of it. No way. All right, didn't happen. What was the problem? I was 
guilty. I, I was deserved to be there and I deserved everything I got. I didn't like it. It was expensive. It wasn't that big of a deal. I, no, but anyways, I was guilty. Okay, so we can do that same thing about sin. Okay, so everybody sinned. So it's not a problem, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> and the problem is not everybody else's problem. It's you. And if you are guilty, you're guilty. And so when we come to a realization of this, not just that there's a heaven, you don't get to go to heaven because you believe it's there. You don't get to go to heaven because you believe there's a God that created heaven and the earth. No, that's not how we get to heaven. All right, because of that problem <laughs> has to be dealt with. The problem is we're guilty. 2,000 years ago, Jesus says, I can take care of this for you, all right? I can, I've got a solution for this problem. And guilty or not, uh, that's okay. Now, I was guilty, and here's what I gave that explanation. I don't know if I messed it up or not or anything, and I got to thinking, uh, the part of your point was that, you know, that uh, God loves us. You know, we're all guilty, but God loves us, and that is true. And so I got up and said I was guilty, and I forgot to say, but I'm forgiven, all right? <laughs> By the way, I paid my debt, and I was forgiven. I can do a traffic ticket, all right? But I can't deal with the sin problem. But God can. And in my life, He has. And so when I think about it as guilty as I am, God has dealt with that. And so I stand before Him forgiven. That problem in my life was solved, all right? Doesn't mean I'm sinless because there's still a problem with sin, but it's not an eternal problem for me anymore. All right, and that was another point of view. I should have got your notes and just preached that. Right? <laughs> preached it's good stuff. All right, uh, but the point is, is that it's been dealt with. We, you know, we don't have to live under the slavery of sin. We have resurrection power. We have freedom. Is that song uh, saying uh, as well? All right. So, so thumbs up. God's heaven. All right. God wants you to go to heaven. What was number one problem? Sin. sin. But two, two thousand years ago, Christ came to solve that problem for us, alright? Because 2,000 years ago, on a dark and dreary day, three men hung on crosses. Three men. Can I see your three there? Alright, so we'll hardly have to work right here. Three men. I know in sign language, three is this. Don't get confused. I know, but I've got to do this one, alright? There's a reason for it. Sarah says, oh yeah, I told you, it's three. Alright, so three. Alright. 2,000 years ago, he solved the problem because three men hung on a cross. So on your thing, just put three crosses that day. All right, 2,000 years ago, three crosses that day. Now, the thing about it is, is Jesus hung on that cross. So Jesus is this, this middle one. By the way, that's our tallest finger right there, all right? And that finger right there is, is the closest to God. Is the fact that God came to us, all right? And so 3,000 years ago, there Jesus was hanging on that cross. You know why he was? It's not because he was guilty. What we just talked about. I was guilty. Because you were guilty. Because there was nothing you could do about that. And so he says, I can solve this for you. Alright? And so he went to the cross. Well, he wasn't alone on the cross that day. There were, there were two men there as well. Three crosses. One on either side. This isn't the only crucifixion. They, the Romans did it all the time. But on that day was an earth-changing day. It was a life-changing day. Because that day, on those crosses, was three men. The only one that's there for us was Jesus. All right, so he's on that middle cross. There was a guy next to him. All right, so there was one man on one side of him, and he was guilty, and he was a thief, and he deserved to be there, and he was dying, and he looked over at Jesus, his only hope, and he cursed him. He had nothing to get said, good to say about Jesus. He had nothing one wanted nothing to do with this man. Uh, had to, to live or die for. Had had no purpose for Christ at all like the majority of the world. Like the majority of the people that we can go and take the gospel to. They don't care. They don't want it. They won't receive it. But we got to tell them because some will. Some will. And there's only a limited amount of time. So that man, he cursed Christ and he received no salvation. He was just inches away from his salvation. Not only the cross, but the man that hung on the cross. Looked him in the eye. God in the flesh after all he had been through, and on that cross, totally innocent, taking our guilt upon himself, and he said, no. But there's another man, and the, the, guy, the guy on the cross on the other side of him looked at Jesus, and he just said a few words. He was guilty as well. He was just as guilty as the other one. But he looked at him, and he realized that this is a man that doesn't deserve to be here. And as best as he could understand the gospel after having a whole life where he didn't have anything to do with that, 
He looked at his only hope. He was only inches away from his only hope. And he simply said, they call you a king. And they say you have a kingdom. He said, would you remember me when you die and go into your kingdom? He didn't understand all that. He hadn't been to Sunday school. None of that. But he reached out. The Bible says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's salvation. Alright? It's not going to church. It's not all that kind of stuff. Whoever calls on the name. When you called on the name of the Lord. That ring right, that uh, finger right there is our, known as our ring finger. Alright? And, and that's a promise. Alright? It represents a promise. So if you're married and you're sharing this, you can share that that you are married or have been married or whatever. If you're not yet, and you say, someday I'm maybe going to have a ring on that finger or whatever, and, and it's all about marriage. But, but listen, it's about a promise. And, and Jesus made that man a promise that day. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You will be saved because you called on me. And this guy made a promise too. All right? He didn't say, I'll live the rest of my life for you because he had no life left to give. But he committed his life, whatever he had left, and we don't know what all we have in the future, but whatever we have, we committed to the Lord. And he wasn't saved because he committed to do things for God, or to make up for all the sin that he had done, or to try to undo his, his bad doings or anything. He just said, Jesus, you're my only hope. That other guy may curse you, but you're my only hope. I'll call upon you. I don't deserve that. I imagine he realized this probably won't work. I don't deserve that. And yet, if you can do it, I'm here. And he did that. So three men on that cross. I want to ask you a question. You stop right there. And you might ask someone else. If you're standing in the line at Walmart or something, you say, we're stuck in line here. I might as well talk to you for just a minute. All right? I want to give you a thumbs up. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. You know, God loves you and he wants you to go to heaven. Um, there really is a heaven. And, uh, and, but there's one problem. There's sin. Sin separates us from God and keeps us from heaven. All right, but 2,000 years ago, uh, Christ came and died on the cross. He hung on a cross. And those, as you share those things right there, you just have to say, as you, if you tell that short little story and you know the story, you might just say, and I ask you today, which man are you? Which person are you? Are you that one that said maybe someday, or I don't think so, or I'm just not buying it, or I'm just not sure, I just don't believe? Are you that person? Are you that person that just calls out to Jesus Christ? Makes all the difference in the world. So that brings us to four. All right? The fact that He died is, again, you've got to just get a little bit further. Because He is our only hope. H-O-P-E. Right? H-O-P-E. So we think of the four-letter word. Uh, hope is something that we all need in this life. We need hope that we can hold on to. Hope that we can believe in. And Jesus Christ is that hope. I, I looked at several different verses uh, for the word hope and how I can do that. Rather than doing a cross stick or something, let me just give you a verse. And I didn't put it on there. So after you put the, the four-letter word is hope. So that, under four, just put there's a four-letter word. You can share this with someone. Let me tell you a little word. The word is hope. And I don't know if you, if you know, but you can have hope in Christ today. And a good verse to go to among some others, and maybe you find a different one for yourself, would be 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, and just that part of that verse, the second part of that verse, uh, it, it, it says that we have put our hope in what? In the living God. We have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all men. i got to hold on to this verse. Don't go to sleep during this. And don't miss this and don't have to listen to this. All right? We put our hope in the living God who is... Uh, in, in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially to those who believe. That's a, tr a little bit of troubling wording in that verse that you can really misunderstand and think, oh, okay, so God, like John 3, 16, God loves the whole world, all right? So He's going to save us all. We're all bad, but He's going to save us all. He came to die for all of us. It's not what it's saying, all right? He's saying that God loves everyone, yes. And He offers His salvation to the whole world. So He is the salvation for the whole world. But when it says especially, it's just saying particularly. In other words, yeah, He's the Savior for the world, but particularly where it really counts for me, where it counts for you, is that it's your, He's your Savior if you believe. Alright? So our hope is in Christ that the Bible says that if we believe in Him, that we can be saved. We will be saved. That's our hope. 
Now, why is this? I'm going to take a break real quick before we get to the last one, all right? Why is this so urgent? Or is it urgent? Yes, it is. This is an urgent. You go, oh, I've heard this. Yeah, I know. What? Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, let me tell you how urgent this is, all right? Uh, I went to uh, uh, the evangelism conference this, uh, this last Monday night, Monday and Tuesday. And uh, just again, I was reminded of all this stuff. That we've got to get after this. We've got to get the word out. We've got to be as witnesses. We've got to evangelize. We've got to reach people. And as he's talking about that, this one man gets up and he preaches a message. His name is Junior Hill. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's preached all over the state. He's in his 80s now. And Junior Hill got up there and told some funny jokes, of which I won't pass on, all right? He told some funny jokes and they were cute and everything like that. But man, I tell you what, he shared a statistic and I've heard this before, I'm sure. I've heard it and I maybe even used it or shared it before. Every time I hear it, I think that can't be true. That can't be true. But it is true. He even said that. He said, I, I made double sure that this statistic is right. That he's not just throwing out a number that's not accurate, all right? Southern Baptists, we keep good records, especially of our Southern Baptist church. We report them into the convention. They tally numbers. They kind of know what's going on out there and, and all that kind of stuff. And he shared, and I've heard this statistic before, that every week, okay? We were here a week ago. So every week, just within the Southern Baptist Convention, and we know there's a million other churches of every denomination doing good work and trying to reach the world too and everything. So church is church, not but but they kept the record, they keep the records on Southern Baptist churches. Every week among Southern Baptist churches, 19 churches close those doors and don't open them again. 19 churches every week close their doors. Can't do it. People aren't responding. They're not coming. That's scary. The thought, the thought that 19 Southern Baptist churches. Now that's not saying I know they're starting new churches too. And so that's not saying well there's you know this many starting this or whatever. Nonetheless, it's just sad if one church closes down. <laughs> it's doing business for the Lord, and for whatever reason, there's all kinds of things that, that happen and stuff. But 19 churches every week. That's why church, we've got to make sure that we don't ever allow ourselves to go down a path where we put reaching people for Christ. Alright? And discipling. It's not just getting them saved. It's discipling. The whole goal is not just to make a convert. It's to make a disciple that makes a disciple. That makes a disciple. Alright? A witness that will then turn around and witness to someone else. And by the way, when you witness to someone that's not been in church... They've got a whole bunch of friends that need to be witnessed to. We don't, maybe. All right? Maybe we hang out with mostly Christians. Maybe, maybe not. I know I do. So I have to go looking because <laughs> I don't just hang out with people like that. So I, we've got to realize they're all around us. That's why Jesus said, look, just open your eyes and look. So we got to witness in such a way. Now, here's, here's where it gets down. Not just churches closing. It's not, it's not about church work. Okay. Again, in the Southern Baptist Convention, there's roughly 40,000 Southern Baptist churches. You say, great, man, there's 40,000 churches. We can spare 19 a week. No, we can't. <laughs> but anyways, there's 40,000 churches. Of the churches that don't close their doors, and I've heard this statistic too, and it gets me every time. Of those 40,000 churches, last year, 9,000 churches, Southern Baptist churches, failed to baptize one person in an entire year. 9,000 churches that are still open for business, still singing the songs and doing the Bible study, but failed to lead one person to Christ and, and to get them to follow through with baptism. That's a scary, sad number. Now, as I thought of the urgency, because door, churches are closing their doors, it's getting hard to share the gospel, even here in, in the Bible Belt. It's just getting hard. Man, the world wants it less and less, but it's still the good news, and there's still lives being changed, all right? But we can do this. We can do this. And I got to thinking about the urgency, and I was going to write some numbers down. I heard some more the other day, and, I, and so let me just throw a couple out there, and let's just get a picture, all right? Uh, Friday. How many of y'all wore red on Friday besides me? All right, thank you. All right. All right. Some of y'all did. Some accidentally. Some of y'all were in red today. Friday was a day to, because of women's heart heart issues, right? So this is the number one uh, uh, cause of, of women dying is, is heart heart attack and heart issues. All right. So it was one, every year they, they do that. I don't know if they observe it, but I heard it because I'm wearing red on Friday. You know? All right. So that's just one statistic. 
But how often do we hear this? Man, you could, you, I could list probably easily a hundred different statistics all separate that one out of four Every day this, I hear this, That uh, I heard one on domestic violence this last week, it's like every 40 seconds uh, of, of someone dies of domestic violence. And then you hear that, and then you hear about drunk driving, you hear about every nine seconds, or I'm not throwing pretend numbers because I don't know the numbers, but every time I hear a statistic like that, just one, I think, man, that's horrible. That's a lot of people. Now you have that, because this is all happening simultaneously. I don't want to paint a bleak picture here. But there are people dying every single second of every single minute of every hour of every day. And day after day, we get 365 in a year. And some churches out of all those can't even get one to accept Christ before that day comes when they die and it's too late. It's urgent. Would you think so? It's urgent. Alright, so let's do our last one. Our time is out. We're here for the last one. God wants you to go to heaven. One problem is sin. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, died on the cross, three men on the cross, but Jesus died to save to give us hope. And our only way to receive that hope is by faith. F-A-I-T-H. It's faith. Alright? We can get a handle on this. It's not by what we do, but what, what Christ does. That if we have faith in Jesus Christ, we can be it's faith. We ask people, would you place your faith in Jesus Christ? Because He's the only one. Alright? We can share that. Can you share that with someone? How easy that is. Now, I took the whole 45 minutes to do this because I explained it. But you can do that probably in about two minutes. And it won't cost you five million dollars or twenty million dollars if you get two minutes worth, alright? And it can be enough to change a person's life. I gotta hand it to you. You got a hand witness. Would you stand with me and let me pray for you? We come to this point every week. Let me tell you, week after week, we see people not being saved in here. Why? Because you and I are not out there witnessing like we need to be and bringing people in here so then they can follow through and become a part of the church that can help them become a disciple that makes disciples. Can we do a better job? Would you commit to that today to look for all the people in the harvest to share either this or something like that or just be a witness. Share Christ with them. I know some of you all are doing that. Some of you all are successful to do that. Listen, leave the results to God. We just have to care. So I'm going to pray for you. And if this is a, a time where you need to commit your life to Christ for the first time, have faith in Him. You can be saved today. If you've already done that but you realize, I can't tell you the last time I've ever shared Christ with anyone. Maybe they'll just figure it out by the way I live my life. They won't live it right. But they won't just figure it out. you got to tell them. Maybe you'll commit today during this time where you're at or come to the altar or whatever but just commit to be a witness for Christ. You are His witnesses. Be a better one. Right? Whatever God's leading you, if you feel led to join the church today, I invite you to do that as well. But let's pray. Father God, we do thank You for Your Word. We thank You, God, for Your simple plan of salvation. We thank You uh, God, that You've explained, that You've shown us in Your Word, God, how there is hope. We thank You for loving us, for offering this free gift of eternal life. Lord, You said we will be Your witnesses. Empower us with Your Holy Spirit. And let us be good witnesses and effective witnesses in this world each and every day as we go. I pray, God, that You just lead us to respond according to Your will right now, real quick, in Jesus' name.